as we come to know, accept, and explore our feelings. They will become sanctuaries and fortresses and spawning grounds for the most radical of, and daring of ideas. And so today we're going to be talking about radical self-care. So what is radical self-care? It's placing yourself at the highest priority of your daily life. So first of all, it's not spa treatments or many petties or retail therapy or escapist activities, though all of these have a part. Radical self-care is much deeper than those things. It's reforming how you think about yourself, prioritizing your needs, focusing on what is required to function at your best and taking the actions necessary to sustain your well-being. So notice I use the word sustain. That's because radical self-care is a lifestyle. You have to engage in it every day. And it's not just something you do once and then you're all better. Every day you require attention. So radical self-care is your commitment to do the work so you can be at your best despite what cancer has done to you. So whether you're newly diagnosed in active or just completing active treatment or living with metastatic disease, the notion of radical self-care is an important core component to thriving despite the difficulty breast cancer brings to your life. As you well know, cancer has affected every aspect of your life, body, mind, and soul. So that's why in this presentation, we're focused on these three pillars of your life, body, mind, and soul. Our goal is to help you feel more at ease prioritizing yourself and giving you resources so that you can make your own radical self-care plan. Many of us think that this kind of focus on self is selfish, but that's not so. Self-care is not selfish. It's about being at your best to be able to give your best. So understand Radical self-care might be really different for each one of you. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. Rather, each one of you can create a plan uniquely suited to your needs. So you might think that self-care stuff is good in theory, but that's not my reality. I don't have time for that stuff. I got to keep it pushing. I get it. But please hang in with me for a bit because I want to show you how to invest in yourself with practical things that can really make a difference and make your life easier. That said, there are uh, so many things that we as Black women share. There are challenges that are not spoken of enough, things that make our life even harder because we are Black and female, no matter where we live or what our health status. Radical self-care starts with an honest acknowledgement of the many obstacles we face as Black women beyond breast cancer that make it more difficult for us to heal and thrive. For example, the COVID epidemic has ravaged our community and continues to be a threat Many of us have lost loved ones or know of someone who has died from the disease. Access to quality care is still lacking for Black folks. And through it all, we as frontline workers and providers remain the most vulnerable. And I have to say, racism and supremacy plagues our community across the country, whether it's injustice reported in the news, and more than likely, more pervasive indignities that go unreported. It's a collective trauma and open wound that continues to fester, not to mention the stress of all the Karens and all the Beckys that we encounter every day. It's annoying and stressful and potentially dangerous. Being on constant alert 
for our safety and that of our families is draining. The burden of being the backbone of our families and communities and the expectation that we must carry the weight of other people's agenda for black women is daunting. The notion of the strong black woman gives us a message that we must be stoic, grin and bear it. And that message is demoralizing and debilitating. And all of that stuff is happening over and above the fact that you're dealing with breast cancer, all of that crap and breast cancers on top of it. Yikes, my point is, Nothing is normal now. And the notion that somehow we're gonna get back to normal is just an added stressor that we place on ourselves that's unrealistic and unachievable. So radical self-care is about building a new normal to make an honest appraisal of your circumstances and daring to imagine what you need to feel seen, cared for, valued, and supported. So there are three pillars of your radical self-care practice. They are body, mind, and soul. Having a clear acknowledgement and understanding of how you are and what you need in these three aspects of your life will give you the starting point to build your new normal and have a more functional and nourishing life. So let's look at all three of these more closely. I call this appraisal the three C's. Focusing on your body, the first of the three C's is comfort. From head to toe, breast cancer treatment has altered the way that you look, function, and feel. Ask yourself things like, are my surgery scars pulling or uncomfortable? Is my skin different? My hair texture changed? My digestion, is it off? Are my intimate lady parts dry or painful? Do I have numbness in my hands or feet? Lymphedema, eyesight blurry, excessive fatigue, brain fog. We have an esteemed naturopathic physician, Dr. Chilko, joining our presentation today. And I won't be talking about medical interventions for all of these symptoms and more. Rather, I want you to take note of these things because they are all issues for you to bring up with your providers and get a plan in place to address these bothersome things. My point is this. Don't suffer in silence. Living with this kind of discomfort is unsustainable. It will erode your quality of life and make your healing process more difficult. The second C is clarity, getting your mind right. It's really a shift and how we view ourselves. It means to value ourselves enough to invest time in our well being and make ourselves our first priority. So, foggy brain is an aspect of breast cancer treatment. Depression is a thing. Ask yourself are you on autopilot, numb, and just coasting, trying to get through the ordeal? Are you fearful? feeling guilty as if something you did caused your cancer. You're frustrated. What kind of self-talk are you doing? Does that little voice in eyes, inside of you say, girl, you should do this or you should do that? I ask you, my girlfriends, please don't shut on yourself. Yes, you're a strong Black woman, but has that become a bludgeon that you hit yourself with with the slightest sign of weakness, every strong person must pause, must rest. Whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, name it. Having this clarity is essential in making a radical self-care plan. The third C is connection. 
Breast cancer is isolating. Even if you're in a house full of people, oftentimes women dealing with breast cancer withdraw from family and friends because you end up holding them up, dealing with their reactions to how your cancer has impacted their lives. Typically, you're the person that everyone else relies on to make their lives easier. To avoid that crap, you might choose to avoid them, but you need support. It just might not come from the places you usually reach out to. Connection is a lifeline. It's a flow of nourishing energy exchanged between people whose only agenda is acceptance and support. Where is your support circle lacking? Don't just assume that you must make do with what's in front of you. In radical self-care, you dare to prioritize your needs and seek new outlets for those needs to be met. Now, I want to talk with you about another kind of connection, and that's the connection with self. Because let's face it, cancer treatment is physically, mentally, and emotionally painful. It's not uncommon for women undergoing this ordeal of cancer treatment to get disengaged from their bodies and feeling, as, uh, feeling the pain as a way of coping with this trauma. Whether consciously or unconsciously, many women wall off their minds and emotions from the trauma of cancer treatment and the aftermath of recognition of what cancer has done to your body. It's kind of going numb just to get through it. At the heart of radical self-care is the recognition that this separation has happened and deciding that you want to feel your life fully again. Thawing the numbness and reintegrating your mind and your body is an essential part of building your new normal. How do you do this? By using your senses to help you feel pleasure again. What you see, what you hear, smell, touch, taste, they all have the potential to give your mind and body messages that it's safe to feel again. It's an awakening of sorts that allows you to become centered and whole. So sensory stimulation is one of the most powerful and effective ways to unleash the flow of your un innate healing energy. So how do you activate this flow? Ask yourself, what are your, some of your favorite smells, tastes, especially since some cancer treatment can rob you of your ability to taste certain things? What are your favorite songs? What sights make you smile? What touch evokes pleasant feelings? Each one of your senses helps to evoke pleasurable responses and helps you feel again. Try it, it's fun. And after all you've gone through, you deserve some respite. So make a plan to indulge all of your senses. So how do you get started? We might have the best intentions to get around to focusing on ourselves, but life has a way of pulling our attention away from us. And often we get relegated to the end of the line, ignoring ourselves altogether because we're taking care of other folks. So I'm encouraging you to write it down, to make it real. What I, what I suggest is that you write down your thoughts, actually take pen to paper and write. What's so good about writing is that it's kinesthetic. What do I mean by that? It, it's a way of learning where you're actually engaging, right? So getting stuck energy and pent up emotions out of your body and onto the page. It's a release 
that allows you to exhale. It's private too. Nobody needs to know this stuff you're putting on the pages or how you're feeling. That's possibly a good thing. So you can cuss out folks all you want on the page and not worry about the craziness that would ensue if you actually spoke your mind. So start by asking yourself, if you could have exactly what you need, what would that be? It's what you need, not what you think you can get or what you would settle for. I strongly suggest you get a journal or a notebook dedicated to this purpose to capture not just your radical self-care plan, but also your observations about what's going on as you execute your plan. Writing it down is also a way to give you focus and hold yourself accountable day by day. So once you've started to set up your self-care focus, you must protect it by asserting your right and responsibility to prioritize you. Hear me, that's something that others in your life might balk at. After all, they're prioritizing their needs and they need you to be what they need you to be for themselves. So it's incumbent upon you to assert your power. You need to establish boundaries, articulate those boundaries and defend them. If you get pushed back, cut them off. Sounds harsh, but it's really important to take care of yourself. And foremost, get comfortable saying no. When other people's agenda threatens to sideline side line your self-care. And just don't say no to them. Practice saying yes to yourself. The next thing I want to really remind you of is enjoy this process. Radical self-care is a different way of being and behaving. And to adopt it, it could feel like just more stuff to do that you don't have time for. But radical self-care can be a relief, a release and fun. It can provide you with the opportunity to step into a new way of being that's more suitable for the woman that you've become since breast cancer had struck. But you don't have to do it all at once. And it doesn't have to be something huge or an expensive undertaking. It can be something very small, like taking a nap. And you don't have to do it all at once, as I said. Pace yourself. Be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself. Give yourself grace. Radical self-care can be as simple as forgiving yourself for making a mistake. We all do it. Is there something that you've always wanted to try? Radical self-care is giving yourself permission to step outside your normal routine and enjoy. So let's explore some new options. Do you know what FUBU is? It's an acronym for for us, by us. It's another way to engage in radical self-care. Recognizing the unique challenges and needs of Black women is much enhanced by engaging with Black providers of goods and services. So we can be strengthening our community while we're strengthening ourselves. And between COVID concerns and the coming of winter weather, you might think you can't do radical self-care because you can't go outside. Not so. You can activate a robust radical self-care practice right in your own home. And lots of things are free or low cost. So there's no excuse not to engage in radical self-care. Here's a few 
starting points for body, mind, and soul that you might not know about and want to try. For your body, movement is essential for your well being. And yoga is a lovely way to gain comfort, flexibility, mobility, and balancing of your body, mind, and soul. And guess what? The Yoga Green Book Directory is a fabulous list of Black yoga teachers and Black-owned yoga studios in virtually every state. They have in-person classes, live Zoom classes, on-demand classes. They even have an on-demand on yoga program for leaving, relieving the stress of racial trauma. So to get your mind right, talk is strong medicine. So we're often taught, girl, don't put your business in the street. And therapy is for white folks. Nope, therapy is for everyone who needs it. And at some point, everyone needs it. So I encourage you to check out Therapy, therapy for Black Girls. It's also a directory to find a Black therapist in your area. You can have Zoom appointments in the comfort and safety of your home, one-on-one -on -one in person, or even groups. To gather your tribe doesn't require that you have to leave home or allow others into your home. Zoom and other apps can be bring people together in a meaningful way, just like we're doing right now. And there's a free version of Zoom that lets you get together for about 45 minutes. And the cost is nominal if you want to opt into having uh, the option for a longer time frame. A good starting place is Black Girls Heal. It's a therapist by a therapist. Her name is Sheena Tubbs, and she's assembled a wonderful resource in the form of a website, a podcast, workbooks, and information sheets for helping to form sister circles. Her podcast, How to Do a Relationship Check-In, helps you to evaluate your current support circle and how to make adjustments as you need to. Understand what I'm talking about in gathering your tribe is that this is an intentional gathering with a purposeful agenda with rules to help you create and sustain a safe place. So I'm not talking about just getting your, your sister lit friends together and talking. This is a different kind of purpose. So in summary, the three pillars of radical self-care are focusing on your body, bodily comfort, having a clear appraisal of your emotional state and your thinking, and connection with healthy people and new places for you to be fully supported. So how do you do that? Listen. Pay attention to your body. Are you feeling pain or discomfort or experiencing swelling or tingling? All of these are messages your body is telling you that you must listen to. Getting your mind right by valuing yourself and your well being enough to speak up and advocate for yourself. Say no to others and say yes to yourself, as I said earlier. And seek out therapy as you need it. There's no shame in asking for help. It takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village for a woman navigating breast cancer to be supported and to thrive as they rebuild their lives. So reach out, bring together your tribe, gather a nourishing, safe group of sisters that have your back no matter what. These three key messages, listen, 
speak up and reach out are the energy that I encourage you to adopt and harness it as you move forward from this talk. It's important to check in with yourself every day because change things, everything's changed day to day. Your energy level, your mood, the outside demands. So your radical self-care plan must be able to respond to the moment. By making a daily appraisal, how does my body feel today? Is my mind right today? Is my tribe accessible today? You can make the course corrections that you need to be at your best, no matter what the circumstances. Understand what I mean by being at your best. It does not mean being perfect. It simply means that you're able to respond to unfolding situations fully present, centered, and purposeful, rather than being batted around by forces beyond you. Radical self-care is about being human and being humane. So I leave you with the words of another one of my favorite Black women writers, Toni Morrison. I hope you've heard of her before. She says, you are your own best thing. And it's true. You're worth the effort of creating and following a radical self-care plan. But only you can do it for you. So start. Start small. But start. Move forward every day with confidence. So LBBC has assembled a resource list for the Knowledge is Power program. And you'll find additional resources on my website also at livethrivership.com. So I thank you for your time and wish you all of the best on your radical self-care journey. That said, take it away, Dr. Chilcote. So that was an awesome message, uh, Jackie, on self-care, and it's so vitally important. And so I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but I'm going to explain what naturopathic medicine is and how it works really well when somebody is newly diagnosed with cancer, if you're presently going through treatment, or if you're in survivorship if you've been diagnosed with metastatic disease. I just want this to be a talk for everybody to really understand the benefits of naturopathic oncology. And I think you'll also notice a lot of overlap between what Jackie was talking to us about with the radical self-care and setting goals and having space for ourselves to be able to take care of ourselves. So first, I just wanna start by explaining what naturopathic medicine is. And basically, it's, um, it's basically a modality of medicine where we use natural therapies to bring about greater health and wellness. So naturopathic doctors get trained in a variety of things like nutrition, acupuncture, uh, physical medicine, which is very similar to how chiropractors work to provide um, proper alignment for your spine. We also get trained in homeopathy and things like that, and really looking for that underlying cause for disease instead of just focusing on treating symptoms. Naturopathic doctors work by six main principles. The first is to do no harm. So initially, if you see a naturopathic doctor, the first thing is, is to not to bring any harm to the patient. Also prevention, really looking to try to prevent any type of disease um, that could come down later in life. Physician as teacher really hones in on the fact that the physician is working to bring high level scientific information to the place where the patient can actually understand what is my diagnosis? What is it about? What treatment options are available? So the naturopathic doctor really works to try to um, provide that education to the patient. The healing power of nature really looks at honoring nature in the fact that 
we know, let's say if we get a paper cut, we know to a certain extent that paper cut is going to heal and we really don't have to do anything to make it heal. So there is a part of nature that helps us. There's an innate healing that's in each and every one of us. Naturopathic doctors also really look to see what's the root cause of a problem and how can we fix that? How can we treat that? And then looking at the whole person is really in, in terms of what we're talking about today, looking at mind, body, and soul, really looking at how can we treat, how can we support the whole person? So naturopathic doctors are trained very similarly to medical doctors. Um, they must have a bachelor's degree, and then they go to four-year naturopathic medical school. Your first two years are very similar to any, any other medical school where you take anatomy classes, physiology classes, microbiology, but your last two years are more focused on your clinical training and rotations. After you graduate from school, there's a series of board exams that you have to take, residency program, and following all these postgraduate trainings, you can become um, a fellow to the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. So I wanna bring this up because naturopathic doctors are not licensed in every state. And so I've listed here all the states where naturopathic doctors are licensed. You can still find people um, in other states that may not be a licensed state that may hold a naturopathic license in one of the licensable states. So let's get to the meat of our talk. So this is an area, these are the areas of interest in terms of naturopathic oncology. One of the main things that we look to address are lifestyle factors, things that can help to improve someone's lifestyle that may be cancer preventative. They may be things like diet, maybe exercise, things that can enhance quality of life. Um, we also work a lot to manage side effects. So if someone is going through treatment and uh, Jackie mentioned a certain side effects like nausea, fatigue, um, vaginal dryness, these types of things, naturopathic oncology takes a holistic look at being able to help manage some of these. Improving quality of life is really important. I think the, um, the talk that Jackie brought to us about really looking at this radical self-care piece and the part about um, the mind-body connection, which I'm gonna touch on in my talk, is really important. But these are things that are gonna help to um, improve that quality of life. And then I just listed here a few integrative services, things like acupuncture, chiropractic care, and massage. And so this is where I'm going to start to talk. And the reason I put this slide in here about gut stress is because guess what? Everybody has stress. Um, even just as recent as 2020, they've done studies with everybody looking across the board in terms of how stress even affects 13 to 17 years old, year olds, even during the pandemic. And they actually rated the highest in terms of stress out of every other age group. So we know that stress affects everyone. But what, what is stress? How do we actually get stress, right? So the way it works is we have two different systems that come from our brain. The first system is a sympathetic nervous system, which I'm sure you've heard of. And that's when our brain perceives if there's a threat, something is happening, something is wrong. What happens is our, our hypothalamus, our brain will actually secrete hormone, will actually secrete that and it will um, trigger a signal to our adrenal gland, which sits above our kidney and says, oh my gosh, there's, we might be in danger. Well, this is like an acute reaction to stress. And I'm sure most of you've heard of fight or flight. This is where we get this adrenaline rush. That's where that term comes from. But then there's another part to stress that we will have. And that's something that goes along, something from the brain, but it starts from the hypothalamus, goes to our pituitary, and then to our adrenal gland. So I know these are really scientific words, but what I want you to know is that that's also known as something called the HPA axis. And you may have heard of that before. This is where we get more into this chronic stress level. And how does the chronic stress actually affect us? Well, the adrenal gland will actually pump out another hormone called cortisol, which we know has been linked to stress, and it also creates more weight gain around our midsection. The other thing that this does is it actually affects and it changes the way our, body immu our body's immune function. 
and also our inflammatory response. So this is a really key key element that I want to stress here, that when we have long-term exposures to stress, it can increase our risk of a lot of what I have here, the high blood pressure, um, some mental, emotional things like anxiety, sadness, depression. And also most importantly here is that it does create a situation where we have a weakened immune system. So I want to go on to the next slide to talk about how does this impact us? What does this do to us when we're going through cancer treatment? How does this further impact us if we're recently diagnosed? How does it impact us if our disease has already been um, diagnosed as metastatic? So any increase in this stress, the two stress responses, but more importantly, the second one, which, the, which was the HPA access, which is more of the chronic exposure to stress. We know that if we have prolonged stress, um, uh, the stress hormone of cortisol that's elevated, that can be a problem, especially if we're not able to clear that out. So with, there is a link and there has been scientific studies to show that chronic stress may have a role in cancer. So I think it's really important for us to really understand the importance of radical self-care and also working to reduce stress in our lives. I have on this slide something called medical qigong. I don't know if you all have heard of it. Pretty powerful. It's similar to Tai Chi, but it's actually a completely different modality. Someone who is trained in medical Qigong can actually teach you the movements and it can be very helpful in lowering something called inflammation in the body. And so I want to talk a little bit about inflammation because we know that there is a link between chronic stress in our body the weakened immune system, but also these inf inflammation. And this can cause damage to our body. It can create other health, health situations. Cancer is one, but also chronic pain, diabetes. There's a lot of things linked to stress. So it's like, okay, how do we take all of that in and change our mind? Like Miss Jackie was saying, how do we change our mindset to go from stress to wellness? because I think it's a, very, it's, it's a very powerful thing that we need to do, just making that mind shift to focus on wellness. What do we need, need to do to invoke that? So these are some tips that I put on here in terms of stress reduction, and I think Ms. Jackie's went over them so well, but one of the things that's really been studied has been prayer, and prayer has actually been proven to help with reducing stress. I think walking, and as you remember the two um, ladies on the previous slide that were walking together, they both had water bottles. This is helping to build that social and that social interaction and also working with movement, making sure that they're hydrated. The, the movement of walking can be very beneficial, especially if you're going through treatment as a form of exercise. Now, I've listed here mindfulness, which is also um, speaks to mindfulness-based stress reduction is the, is the official name for it. But it's very similar to what Miss Jackie was talking about, our perceptions, the things that we um, smell, that we taste. It's basically using our senses to become more mindful of our environment. For example, when I first started learning about not mindfulness, I actually learned that you can be mindful even just in taking a shower. You can be mindful in taking the space and the time that you need to actually enjoy those sensations and taking in that information. Even eating a meal can be done mindfully. Acupuncture can be incredibly beneficial for reducing stress, but can also be helpful to reduce a lot of side effects like um, nausea, um, fatigue, um, pain, joint pain, if people are taking aromatase inhibitors and, they're, um, and, and they, they're having a lot of joint pain and achiness, acupuncture can be very helpful. And then my stress tip, tip on here is to really just take a deep breath during the day. This can be very powerful and can to help reduce some of those inflammatory markers and also reduce our stress in an instant. Sometimes it's just as few as three to five breaths and the way you do that is you will take it from your diaphragm. And so that is below your lungs. And it will basically, you're going to fill air up into your diaphragm. And as you breathe in, 
you should see your stomach expand. So we don't wanna do chest breathing, but we wanna do deep belly breaths. And this is something that I always encourage people to do, but you wanna check with your doctor. Sometimes people have a difficult time taking a really deep breath, but if you're able to, it can be powerful for reducing stress. Okay, so let's talk about food. I love, love, love this slide. And one of the reasons I love it is because there's so many foods listed, there's so many foods pictured here that have so many wonderful benefits. So I'll just start with the beautiful grapefruit, right? So we've got lots of vitamin C, high in antioxidants. We've got our broccoli, Brussels sprouts. These are two vegetables that actually come from the family of, brass, of the brassica family. And so these vegetables actually are very high in something called glutathione, which can be very supportive for our liver for detoxifying from harsh chemicals and toxins in that way. And also broccoli has something called sulforaphane, which also has been known as, a, as the green chemo prevention um, vegetable which means that it can be very powerful in terms of an anti-cancer treatment. Um, it also, they also make it in little supplements where it's powdered up and people can take this as a supplement. But I think just eating broccoli is actually a great option. It's, it's filled with fiber, it gives you the sulforaphane, it's high in glutathione. So you're getting so many awesome benefits from that. Same thing with avocados. Avocados are high in something called omega-3s, which are very good for anti-inflammatory. So when I was talking before about the stress connection and increasing inflammatory pathways, eating things like avocado helped to drive that down. Oatmeal is on here. So oatmeal is great for a number of reasons. We know it for fiber, but also what about our B vitamins and our magnesium and iron? I mean, it's just such a great, food where we can get so many benefits all in one in one um, bowl of oatmeal. And then flax seeds are on here. And flax seeds, again, great for omega-3 content and being able to work on terms of that anti-inflammatory response. We've got ginger. I don't know if anybody can see the ginger. It's to the left by the broccoli. And then also that gold that bowl of a gold powder is something called curcumin. And these are also really good for as anti-inflammatory. So that's just a little taste of some things that I think are really good to bring into our diet. So let's talk a little bit about nutrition and why is nutrition so important, right? And one thing I forgot to mention, um, when we do eat foods, we want to try to eat things that are colorful. So you notice that picture was so colorful. One of the reasons why I selected it is because when we eat things that are colorful, we're getting a number of different nutrients, right? So we're getting our antioxidants. We're getting the sulforaphane that I mentioned. We're getting um, so many different elements to the food where we can actually use food as our medicine. And it also helps us to impact, it also gives us um, a feeling of, oh, wow, I actually feel different. I feel like I'm doing something healthy. And we're also detoxifying from a lot of environmental pollutants when we make these dietary changes. So one thing I want to encourage is eating organic uh, fruits and vegetables daily. This is going to be helpful for fiber, but also for regular elimination. I also think this is really helpful, especially when people are going through treatment to make sure that you're having regular bowel movements. Limiting sugar, alcohol, and caffeinated products. The reason this is here, I have worked with a lot of patients, especially when they complain of hot flashes, things like that, which could be related to hormones, but also when you're going through treatment, sometimes it can be exacerbated depending on what your treatment is. Limiting these elements can also be helpful in this arena. So I often give my patients this advice, limit sugar, sodas, things like that. In terms of um, protein, protein is great, but we may not need to focus so much on animal protein, beef, chicken, lamb. I think that if you do eat meat and you're not vegan or vegetarian, meat is fine, but we don't want to consume much more animal protein because that's higher in saturated fats, which are leading more towards that infl inflammatory diet. So there's sources like rice protein and nuts and beans and quinoa that can be considered in, in terms of um, getting enough protein. And then in terms of hydration, we want to make sure that we're drinking 
filtered water. If you're not sure what that is, I have a link at the bottom for the environmental working group because they have a lot of information on if you're looking to um, get filtered water in your home or to get a filtration system, they've got a lot of great products that they review. And if those, I don't know, some of them can be expensive, Sometimes even just getting a Brita water filter that you can pick up from Walmart or Target can also be very beneficial. All right, so let's get moving, right? So the moving part, I love this slide too, because it really just shows the empowerment, not only of that radical self-care, but just being able to really move. And as we mentioned, I think Ms. Jackie mentioned before, you know, part of it is like, especially when we've experienced racial trauma because of because we are African American just trauma from uh, could be a bad relationship from childhood whatever we want to get rid of those types of feelings and i recently was in a conference and it was on trauma and violence and what types of treatments are available and movement is a huge component to that if it's a lot for you, depending on where you are in your in your journey, your health journey, I would suggest walking. Walking is a great way. Um, the the woman on the bottom that has the bar up, I don't know how much weight she has on there, but you know you want to always check in with your physician, your physical therapist, your um, uh, a personal trainer, just to make sure that you're doing things safely. You don't wanna start an exercise program that's gonna to be too aggressive or may harm you in any way. But I suggest doing something that you like and get moving. This can be incredibly beneficial just for your overall immune system as well. It's gonna to help to bump that up, especially when we're, we're experiencing chronic levels of stress. So I've put out here a few naturopathic recommendations. And these are things, again, Want to always consult with your oncologist or your physician prior to starting any new supplement. I have them on here because these are ones I think that are just foundational supplements that it's good for people to be on, especially if you're newly diagnosed with a breast cancer, or even if you're in treatment or you're in survivorship or you have metastatic disease. These are still really powerful. The fish oil is something that really helps to drive the, down those inflammatory pathways that I was talking about before very high in omega-3s. The level of DHA at 1400 milligrams also helps and can be supportive for your brain cognition. So fish oil can be helpful in several ways, um, helping to drive down inflammatory markers, mood, and also with cognition. Um, vitamin D is something, again, that I think is very beneficial and you'd wanna make sure you get your vitamin D levels checked. So the ideal range is between about 40 to 70 uh, nanograms per mil. So when you get like a lab report back and you look at your number, you wanna just make sure it's around that range. Um, the recommended dose is taking um, the active form of vitamin D3, that's the active form. So if you ever have, if you ever look at vitamin D supplements, always make sure it's the active form, the vitamin D3. And the with vitamin K part is on here because that actually helps with bone health. So you want the purpose of the vitamin D is also to help with bone health in combination with the vitamin K. And that should be taken best with food. It helps with absorption. And then probiotics, I'm sure everybody's heard of probiotics and probably even takes probiotics. But ba basically um, in within our gut, we have something called our microflora or our microbiome. We get it from birth, we get it from our moms, whether we were born vaginally or we were born by C-section, we get our microflora initially from birth, okay? We can um, eat things that help to keep our microflora healthy or we can engage in poor dietary habits which drive up our inflammation and also create a situation where bad bacteria can overgrow, okay? Because 70% of our immune system is actually in our gut, we want to make sure that our gut is as healthy as possible. One way to do that is by taking probiotics. You can take them with food. They will help with digestion and bowel function. I've listed a couple of products that you can pick up over the counter if you're interested in that as well. But again, consult with your doctor um, or physician before starting any new supplements. Okay, so I want to talk uh, briefly about naturopathic recommendations to reduce side effects. So we talked, um, I know Jackie was mentioning some different side effects. So I want to just speak specifically how naturopathic oncology can help to reduce some of these. So appetite, 
constipation, some people may not have an appetite or they may be too nauseous as to why they don't have an appetite. But appetite can actually be stimulated. And one way we use, um, uh, an, not an herb, but we use ginger that can help with stimulating appetite. There's ginger tea that can be a nice, soft, gentle way to do it. There's another tea called Eater's Digest Tea that can really help to stimulate um, appetite. Some people will even use a small amount of apple cider vinegar mixed in water to help with stimulating appetite. It also can be preventative for something called GERD, that reflux. Constipation, I talked about probiotics, which are incredible for making sure we're, we stay regular. Um, there are other things that people find helpful. There are different forms of magnesium. So I always hesitate to bring that up, but magnesium um, in certain forms can be very helpful um, in terms of staying regular, like a magnesium citrate can be helpful. Fatigue, hot flashes. I mean, fatigue is a, is a, is a real big one. And I think one of the things that I've seen that have been most helpful is movement and doing some form of exercise. There are certain supplements um, that, you know, in naturopathic oncology, I might recommend. They may be some herbal things. Um, there may be some amino acid complexes. There'll be something that I may recommend, but it would be very specific to that person. Um, lymphedema, one of the things that um, I've I've worked with patients with this, and usually I recommend them to a massage therapist that is well-trained and sees patients who focus on breast cancer and knows how to do lymphatic um, massage. Neuropathy is a big one. So for this, usually we start with B vitamins. Sometimes I'll go up into doing something um, with vitamin E. Caveat with vitamin E, most vitamin E's are only like alpha tocopherol as the vitamin E. So I usually look for like a mixed tocotrienol type complex um, to support patients, especially when they're having neuropathy. And then sleep is a big one. Um, I think I see sleep probably the most. And I just want to bring up another supplement, which is something called melatonin. And I know people may have recommended it before about sleep, but it also does something else really, really incredible. Um, at high doses, melatonin has been researched and studied to actually have an anti-cancer, anti-proliferative effect. So this is something that we see from an early diagnosis, even someone who has been diagnosed with the metastatic um, breast cancer, that melatonin at a higher dose is actually can be very beneficial. Now, one caveat I will bring up with regards to supplements is that all supplements are not created equal. And so you want to work with a naturopathic doctor or someone who, um, you know, can recommend good quality professional line supplements because all supplements are not created equal. And I do think that you want a company that really looks at the quality and they really look at doing third-party testing with their supplements. Okay, so in terms of improving quality of life, this is just kind of in summary, some things that we've, we've shared and talked about already with prayer and the mindfulness. Um, this developing this level of, of practice will not only improve quality of life, but I also think it brings peace of mind. It also helps with this mind shift that needs to be made towards healing and wellness. Restful sleep, so I mentioned the melatonin a moment ago, but getting enough sleep is actually incredibly beneficial for your immune system. So I'm always concerned when a patient is not getting at least six to eight hours of sleep. If someone's only sleeping three or four hours, we wanna make sure that we understand what's going on with sleep. Do they have elevated cortisol levels, like I've mentioned before? Um, there's ways to test this out to figure out what's going on. But again, this is naturopathic um, oncology, which tries to get to the root cause of what's actually happening. And then just encouraging healthy diet. This is something that, um, you know, I would suggest making something like a smart goal, like Everybody has great goals. I want to get healthy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But just start with something specific that's achievable to you in a realistic time frame. So I had a patient once. She was 80 years old. She had been diagnosed with colon cancer. I asked her if she'd been drinking any water because she had a lot of problems with constipation. She's like, I only drink a half a glass of water a day, just enough to get my pills down. So what I did was I said, you know, 
Can we try to make it as a goal just to drink one glass? Even though I know eight glasses, eight ounces a glass is, is recommended per day, this patient wasn't there yet. So I would suggest start wherever you are, just making the healthy dietary choices for yourself and you can create, um, they're called SMART goals, something specific, measurable, um, achievable for you. We talked about reducing stress. I also talked about the importance of exercise, movement. There's been a lot of literature um, in the research that talks about um, exercise and especially uh, resistive and aerobic exercise in cancer patients also helping with immune system. Uh, journaling, I think journaling is incredibly powerful. It gets those thoughts out on paper and it really can be incredibly therapeutic. Counseling, as Jackie mentioned before, very beneficial. I, I think everyone can benefit because when I mentioned the part about stress and I talked about the hormones in the brain going down to the adrenal gland, that the adrenal glands are the ones that sit above the kidneys. There's a whole mind-body connection that's happening in us, whether we're aware of it or not. So I think having counseling that can focus on, uh, you know, understanding this mind-body connection can be very powerful. Social interactions we talked about, that's a whole nother dynamic, especially when they're healthy, social <laughs> interactions, uh, that can be really healing and therapeutic and acupuncture I've talked about as well. So in the last few minutes, I just wanna give a few things that we want to avoid. So I wanted to provide things that could be encouraging, that you wanna incorporate in your life, but then there's certain things that we actually wanna avoid, all right? And the reason why you wanna avoid them is because they can create damage, um, they can create toxin levels in our bodies, and we wanna do things where we're, if we're working so much on radically taking care of ourselves and eating right and exercising, what are some things that we don't wanna do that may counteract our good efforts, right? So I put on here plastic water bottles. If plastic water bottles, this is, this is really true in the summer, when we leave our water bottle in the car, and we leave it there for a couple of days and we come back and we say, oh, I've got water. That water is probably not a good idea to drink because anytime plastic gets heated, it actually leaches out into the water. It could be food, whatever it is, especially that thin, flimsy plastic. So that's just something to be mindful of. Also heating those containers in the microwave. This is one I think it's important, direct body contact with electronic devices. I bring this up every time I talk. I've had I have just seen this um, and I've seen people who will keep their cell phone right, you know, in their pocket and it'll be right next to their breast or, and I'm concerned about that because I don't think we have enough evidence to show the safety of putting these to actually, we, we know that we shouldn't put them directly on our body. So that's, it. that's a concern. So we want to make sure that we have a space, even the laptop on our lap. We don't want to have direct contact with electronic devices directly on parts of our body. Cosmetics is another big, um, a big one. The website that I have below with the Environmental Working Group is huge. It can really help you to go through looking at your cosmetics. Are there things that have been known to be carcinogens? Are there things that are known to cause reproductive harm? There's a whole database that evaluates over 80,000 cosmetics that can give you, an, um, it gives you a score. I think it's zero to seven and it'll show you what's good, what's not so good and what is something you wanna stay away from. Smoking is definitely a carcinogen, which we've, we've heard about for years. I wanna talk about our meats a little bit. So especially when we char our meats, when we barbecue, um, that little black part around the edge that people think is crispy, that's also known carcinogen. We want to make sure that we're trying to consume um, organic produce because we know that when foods are not organic in terms of produce, um, they are heavily, they can be heavily sprayed with pesticides. There is a way to try to clean that off by certain washing procedures. But um, if you go to that environmental working group, it will give you two lists. One list will show the foods that are heavily sprayed with pesticides, which I highly recommend getting those to be organic. And then there are some that are considered the clean 15, which are still sprayed, but in less, like it's not as harmful. 
So in those instances, sometimes you can go the uh, non-organic route. And then just really being conscious of sugary drinks that are really high in high fructose corn syrup and those types of things. So I thank you all so much. I know this was a lot and I was trying to think I've gone over my time just a touch, but I wanted to make sure that you had resources regarding um, environmental working group for things. If we're working so hard to take care of ourselves, I want to make sure that we also know things that we're not that we're doing that we may not want to do, we may want to avoid doing so they don't, we don't counter any effects and that we can be our best healthy self. So I thank you all so much and I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Chilcote and Jackie. What you all presented tonight was just so much, so needed. <laughs> um, I want to get right down to the questions because we have a lot of questions for you. And I know our time is going to be coming upon us. So let's start off with the questions. Um, you know, here's the issue around some of the side effects when it comes to being on chemo. You know, one of the major side effects that we see is women have issues with their nails. Um, do you know if there's anything that you can recommend that can help them with their nails um, to either keep them from falling off or to just help them heal after they have um, fallen off? Is that question for me? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay, no problem. So um, one of the things that I would use um, for patients is they can um, take a supplement that's like a hair, skin and nail, depending on what chemotherapy they're on. Sometimes taking that can be helpful for their nails. Um, rubbing some kind of a cream on there can be helpful so that they're not dry. But the, the thing that I've used the most has been a supplement that's been, um, you know, dedicated for hair, skin and nails. Awesome, thank you. And Dr. Jackie, just wanna ask you a question around the radical self-care. You know, how do you deal with just when you're challenged, you know, you have so much weight on your shoulders and we're always saying yes. And sometimes we have a difficult time saying no. How do we break past that barrier of not being able to say no? How, can you give us some insight on how can we actually say no and not feel bad about it? Yeah, first of all, Take a moment, take one beat and just breathe. You know, just really center yourself because if you're gonna react like this, you're just gonna uh, kind of jump in and the path of least resistance sometimes is, oh, I'll just do it, I don't, you know. So step back and breathe. And then what I would say is um, give them the opportunity to learn how to do what they're asking you for. For example, we automatically assume that we have to uh, do our kids' lunches or laundry, or we have to be the one who takes the notes at the, at the, uh, at the program or all of this. Delegate. <laughs> Sometimes it's not saying no, just like no, and that's it. It's kind of like, let's you and I put our heads together and think about how this can get done because I can't do this helping them to strategize about and, and give them the opportunity to decide how that they can do it without you in the, uh, in the mix. Do you understand what I mean? Sometimes they're just, it's uh, habitual. They ask you and you respond. If you break the chain of that habitual response by sitting back, breathing, and then say, let's troubleshoot this. I'm not gonna be able to do this, but hey, have you tried this? Or, you know what? I have a lot of faith in you. I know you can do that. I'll pray for you, sister. I got your back. I'm not gonna be able to do that, but I know you can. So sometimes you have to flip the script of, of how you habitually in, engage with people and if you react differently, they don't have a choice but to react, respond differently. When they encounter a soft no, it doesn't have to be no. It can be a soft no, like, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do that right now, but I know you can. Or have you, why don't you try this? So there's a soft no and there's a hard no, and you can learn how to employ both of them. But no is still no, and you have to um, stand your ground. Don't let yourself be bullied 
into somebody else's agenda for you. You have your own agenda. Hold fast to that. Awesome. Can I say Thank something you. to that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. That was awesome, Ms. Jackie. The other thing I was just going to encourage is that mindfulness piece, because I think mindfulness teaches you, um, as you have and you develop your own practice in that way, you're less responsive as quick to just shoot back because you're in a space where you're thinking, you're processing, and then you provide your answer. So I just love that. I just wanted to 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 jump on Jackie's answer there. Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much because it's needed. You know, it's really needed. So getting back to Dr. Chilko, getting back to those side effects, you know, we tend to see a lot of side effects. And two of them that you mentioned um, in your presentation was hot flashes and nausea. Can you tell us a little bit again about what people can do to address those two side effects? Sure. So nausea is a big one. I think acupuncture is great. If you can't do acupuncture, there's something called acupressure. And there's certain points that you can do at home by yourself pressing in certain points. There's a point uh, right here, it's in between those two tendons you have on your arm, about two finger lengths down, so about right there. And that's known as a point called pericardium six, which can be very helpful for nausea. So even when people feel that way, they can hold that point, they can rub it, you can Google it, okay, and find out where it is. But that's a good one. Ginger's also really good. Ginger comes in the form of candies, teas, um, those little chews are great. Something called C-bands can be worn similar to when you're on a cruise and you wear those little, those little bands or pregnancy bands. That can be helpful for nausea as well. Um, there's acupuncture or auricular acupuncture that can be helpful. So there's a multitude of different things. Um, and then in terms of hot flashes, so the one that most people always know about is black cohosh. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for everybody. So for me, my strategy is a little bit different with, with the hot flashes. It's really getting to know what medication that person's on, if, you know, where they're at in their cycle. Some people are not having periods. They've been thrown into menopause. Some people still are. So it's kind of like a tricky thing to, to do. But sometimes um, even, even primrose oil works well for people. Like I said, black cohosh. I use something called hesperidin, which is more bioflavonoids, which can be helpful. Um, so it just depends on how someone's experiencing it and then also reducing things like the sugar and the caffeine products too, because that can be uh, harmful. So another one is what black women tend to face far more worse than others. And that's the big N, neuropathy. How do we deal with neuropathy? How do we address not only the neuropathy, but even the pain that comes with some of the medications that we're on? So neuropathy is another one. There's several different things that have been used to treat. Um, I, like I said, when I go over supplements, I don't want this to be like, oh, I'm going to run out and go get that. You always have to check with your oncologist. You have to check with your doctor to make sure it's not going to interact or interfere with anything that you're already taking. But B vitamins can be really helpful, even just uh, B1, which is thiamine. If somebody's deficient with that, that can be helpful. Doing a B complex, vitamin E. I talked a little bit about um, doing a mixed form of vitamin E, not just the alpha tocopherol, but the mixed tocotrienols. I've seen that be very helpful. Again, you wanna make sure you check with your oncologist, especially if you're on blood thinners or things like that, because uh, vitamin E does have a little bit of a tendency to thin, not thin the blood, but it has a little blood thinning effect. Um, also omega-3s, though omega-3 uh, fish oil can be helpful in terms of supporting for neuropathy. Um, there's a powder called L-glutamine powder sometimes we'll use, especially if you have, I should have mentioned this, especially if your treatment has been with Taxol. So there's been certain studies um, if you're on something called Paclitaxol or Taxol, um, doing this L-glutamine powder can be very beneficial to help with neuropathy. Um, and that's, these are kind of like specifics that I would, you know, have to, you know, give you a dosage and all that, but there are just a few things that you could probably research on your own with regards to that. I can't think, oh, acupuncture is huge. Also a therapy that I do called um, cold laser therapy, 
which is a class 3B laser, so it doesn't heat up, you don't feel anything, but it can be incredibly beneficial for increasing blood flow and helping to reduce symptoms of neuropathy as well. Uh, foot baths are great. Sorry, I've got like a whole list, laundry list of stuff. Um, some people will even find using the apple cider vinegar in a foot bath to be helpful. Um, I don't think the effects are as lasting when they, they do that, um, but just it gives people a little bit of relief as well. So. Now, what about ALA? So the alpha lipidic acid, yeah. Yep. ALA is great. And also, especially if somebody's diabetic, that can be helpful with blood sugar as well. But again, ALA is something that you definitely want to ask your oncologist about. Um, some are not on board because it is such a potent antioxidant mm -hmm. that they may not want you to take that while you're on treatment. So, but if you're not on treatment, that would be a great, a great option. All right. So we're going to move away from the side effects. I mean, You've talked about nutrition and we hear this a lot. There are a lot of questions about nutrition. So I'm going to shoot them at you. Now, when it comes to purchasing, you know, we think about people who are in rural communities, they may not have access to certain foods. What about eating canned vegetables and fruits? What does that lie? Yeah. Great question, Tia. So I will say, so the best that you can get would be fresh, right? So fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. Um, the next best is if you can get frozen. And the reason why it has to do with the enzymes within the food itself. So it kind of goes up through a tier. So you have fresh and you have frozen and then you have canned. The canned is going to have the least enzymatic activity. So by enzymatic, that's your enzymes, the things that you're gonna need for your body to optimally function. If that's all you have access to would be cans, then that would be okay, but it's not gonna give you the same benefit as a live food because there's preservatives added, right? And so when I've been faced with this question before, I've encouraged people, um, if they are in a rural community, if there's, if there's community farmers that are having, um, they grow certain things in, in season, vegetables in season, it may be really helpful as opposed to the canned option. So that I don't have enough resources to talk in depth about that, but um, I think farmers markets or connecting with local growers would be a good, a better, a better route to go with that. Yeah, and even sometimes that's a challenge, you know. So, next question. This is a good one. You know, we know we have the hormone-based cancers, and we hear all of this about, you know, soy and and flax seeds. So, what do we think about flax seeds? Are these things safe as well as soy? especially for those estrogen di driven cancers. Yeah, so soy, I would be cautious of that because a lot of what we get as soy in this country is synthetic, a synthetic version. So we don't, we're not getting natural soy products, okay? So that's the first, that's why I usually drive people away from it. Flax seeds can be very beneficial um, in terms of uh, that omega-3 and driving down the inflammatory pathways. I haven't had any issues with recommending uh, flax seeds to patients. Now, is there a difference between the oil and the actual seed? And is there one better than the other? So if you take the actual seed, it looks like a full seed. I think I had a picture where you saw them in the bowl there. So what you would do is you want to grind them up. You can use a coffee grinder or blender to grind them up. But once you do that, they can go rancid pretty quick. They'll start to smell funny or off. So you want to make sure after you grind them that you put them in the refrigerator in a sealed bag and not like enough for more than 30 days, but it's something where you can take a scoop out, you can sprinkle it in yogurt, you can put it over your food. That's gonna help increase your fiber, right? Cause you've got the seed. Now, if you do the oil, you don't get the fiber component, but you still get the benefit of the oil, which will help with the omega-3s and, and the inflammatory pathway. Now, another thing is we hear a lot about these different studies. You know, we hear about the um, celery juice, and now there's one that's coming out about cauliflower juice. You know, this was a research study that was recently came out in Italy regarding the cauliflower juice and being able to kill off cancer cells. Can you speak to a little bit about that? I have not heard of cauliflower juice, but that's cool, though. Um, so <laughs> Flour is one of those veggies that's in that group, that brassica group, with the broccoli and the kale and the Brussels sprouts. So incredibly powerful for that, um, uh, that cancer prevention benefit. And even if somebody, even when you have a diagnosis of breast cancer, 
or metastatic. These are, these are things that are so powerful that can be such a benefit to your health, just getting them in. Again, going back to the SMART goals, if you're not eating vegetables or very little right now, just try to even getting a few doses of that in every week can be really beneficial. So I can't speak to the exact study, but I would love to read about it. Um, I don't know about juicing, juicing that, that seems interesting, but I'm sure it'd be very beneficial. Yeah. And Dr. Jackie, back to you. So one of the questions that we have is, you know, we talk about this self-care thing, but how do you do self-care when you live in an environment that is, you know, unsafe, highly toxic, it is very stressful. How do you do this thing called self-care in that type of environment? Yeah, self-care, like I said in my, my talk, is something that is really very individual. Um, uh, so sometimes it, it means um, focusing on, on safety issues, um, either re removing your, yourself from the situation or walling yourself off from a situation, getting a little quiet corner where you can center yourself, um, uh, being able to uh, buddy up uh, with someone else to uh, for safety for walking or those kinds of things. So it's toxic can be so many things. Uh, it can you know it can be a safety issue. It could be uh, you know a chemical exposure. So it's it's hard to respond to that. But what I can say, you have to center yourself with the determination that I'm in this situation, even if I can move this a half an inch that way. That's still self-care. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It could be taking a nap. You know, it could be uh, deciding that you, you're not feeling good enough to go to a particular event. Um, it can be so many different things. It could also mean, you know what? I really want to have a certain, I'll give you an example of it. Um, there's, uh, it's cilantro. <laughs> uh, some, you, sometimes there's one little thing that can make all the difference for how you feel about if you've been seen, if you've been accommodated. If your family doesn't like cilantro, but you do, it's okay to take that 49 cents or $1.49 or whatever it is, and go ahead and buy yourself a bunch. You don't have to slather it into everything else, but you can put it on top for yourself. So going into your senses, that was a taste bud kind of thing. Going into your senses is a good way to center yourself. Play some music, you know, aromatherapy, burn a candle. You know, there's so many things that if you can center yourself, you can see yourself easier. And if you can see yourself easier, you can, you can discern and take action that's appropriate for that situation. Do you understand? But sometimes we're just so much on autopilot or we're just numb or frustrated that we don't have our faculties about us so that we can troubleshoot a situation. So anything that can start by centering yourself is a good way to be able to turn up the volume on how you're able to discern what your circumstance is and what is that half inch step that can cause you to be able to see differently, respond differently. And then from that half inch, you know, you can take another half inch. Um, so it's, if you can center yourself, you can see yourself, you can respond rather than react. You, you understand the difference of response is being able to discern and make choice. React is just instinct. So you want to flip the, strip, the script from just instinctually res, you know, reacting to something and center yourself enough that you can discern there is always a half an inch step that you can take that's going to buy you some time, buy you some ease, give yourself, give yourself a different way, a different perspective, so you know 
what steps you can take that are going to be responsive in that moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Jackie, and thank you so much, Dr. Chilko. We have so many more questions, but unfortunately, we're out of time. 